Hi folks, today we are here with Dr. Matt Tannenberg and he's located in Phoenix and he's got a website at ArcadiaCairo.com um, I'm just going to actually do a little bit of an interview with Matt today and ask him some questions about the field of Cairo as well as also uh, how people can turn around and possibly find out more info about this. Um, how do people find a doctor that does this type of work that you do? Let's say a person's out of state and they're from Wisconsin. Do you have an idea of what site they would look that up under? It's sigma-instruments.com and that's the only uh, database that shows who has these ultra line pro adjusters. Okay, awesome, that's great. Um, you've been doing chiropractic for how long now? Uh, five years now. Five years? Yep. Okay. And you're a graduate of? Palmer West Chiropractic in San Jose. Okay. That was a good school? Yeah. it's uh, So there's three Palmer locations. The main campus is in Davenport, Iowa. There's one in uh, Port Orange, Florida, then one in San Jose, California. Okay. And they all teach very similarly. There's a lot of there's a lot of differentiation between chiropractic schools, which is why if you go to 10 different chiropractors, you see 10 different things. Um, and even within the Palmer schools themselves, there's some variations. So Palmer West is uh, probably one of the most uh, sports-based rehab chiropractic schools out there. Okay, great. How is your schooling, would you say, different from that of a PT or a medical doctor? Sure, and really, I've talked to a lot of people about this, but really the first year of dental school, med school, PT school, chiropractic school, it's all pretty much the same. You learn basic anatomy, you learn physiology, all body functions, etc. And then after that first year, everybody breaks off. So then PTs learn more on rehab, muscle, tendon work. Chiropractors get more into joint, nerve, disc-related issues. MDs get to more drug interactions and stuff like that. So everybody kind of differentiates from there. But that first year is pretty much the same throughout any medical profession, really. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so you know me as a massage therapist. I work out of a gym up here called S&J Fitness here in North Scottsdale. Um, I've been doing massage therapy for 20 years myself. Um, I work here out of a gym and we realize that the in thing these days is to work out and it's popular. Is it a good thing in your opinion to work out if you are out of alignment or say like one shoulder is higher than the other or you have limited range in a shoulder? Should one just push through it and toughen up and get through the workout? even though they're in pain or stiffness? Definitely not. I mean, if you are if you have pain, you have stiffness, you have structural imbalances or issues, you're basically training your body to stay in that pattern. So if you keep, if you have one shoulder higher, like Dave said, and, and you're lifting in that form, you're basically encouraging your body to stay that way. So what it'll do is create more pain. It'll, it'll make that your normal versus if you go fix the problem now, you address it, then you ease back into exercise, you're going to function normally, properly, be pain-free, etc. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you would not recommend to just push through going to, you know, doing new highs on your bench press when you have problems with the joint. Definitely not. Okay. <laughs> That's not going to help you out in the long run. <laughs> well, I see a lot of that in this gym from sure. time to time. And I mean, there's it's a very gray line it's very subjective of what's pain versus what's sore what's what sore muscle versus what is engaging muscle like you're supposed to when you're exercising but it's not smart at all to push past things that don't feel normal and you have uh, i mean delayed onset muscle soreness doms comes on 24 to 48 hours after you work out so if that if one it's more intense than your typical soreness it's too much for you something's off or if it lasts longer in that 48 hour period it's too much for you or something's off you got to get checked out so just remember that, guys, if you're a Navy SEAL as well, okay? Moving along here, does, um, does an inversion table therapy or gravity boots, does that put my back in place? Uh, let me expand on that by saying, don't my bones move kind of from a horizontal nature, which is uh, side to side? or versus vertically up and down? 
Um, I guess where I'm, I'm kind of a little confused is there's several people I know that hang on inversion tables and they say that that puts their back in place. It's, it's not going to change the structure at all. So um, there's other therapies you can do that do traction. The problem with inversion tables and stuff like that, it is, it's traction out your spine. It's more working on your disc than anything. But the problem is you're not going to be stuck, restricted through every single segment of your spine. So if you traction everything out, you're going to create issues. You can create hypermobility, too much motion through areas that are already moving properly. And the areas that are stuck and need to get moved are going to be still stuck. They're not going to release just from inversion or traction or something like that. So there's other therapies. Uh, there's spinal decompression. There's a lot of therapies that can target just specific areas of what needs to be tractioned out versus just stretching the whole thing out and not really... Uh, fixing an issue. There's also a possibility that there could probably be too much blood going to the head as well. 100%. Yeah, which and people set themselves up wrong and fall off and hurt themselves and create new issues too. Sure, sure. So what typically is it that makes a bone come out of uh, place or out of alignment? Uh, is it being pulled out by muscle? Uh, what's, what's going on there? Why does a bone come out of alignment? There can be a lot of different things. The easiest answer is stress. Um, stress creates issues throughout your whole spine. So there's a lot of types of stresses. There's emotional stresses. There's marriages, kids, jobs, whatever you got. There's chemical stressors, you know, air quality, nicotine, tobacco, um, your, your alcohol. That stuff's going to affect how your body functions. And then obviously physical stress is what you think about the most. You, you have a tough workout, you throw something out, you throw a rib out, you have um, car accident and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different things that can make your spine move or twist or things to go out of place. Um, so stress is the easiest answer, but it can also come from repetitive postures, um, sitting too long, slouching, whatever it is. So your spine will get restricted from any kind of activity that's done too long a lot of times or direct trauma. And then you hear of... Uh, like muscle memory, your body almost has this innate uh, memory, if you will, of old injuries, traumas, postures, ergonomics, whatever it is. And so if something's stuck, if I have a right shoulder issue from 10 years ago, if I'm going to have pain, it's most likely going to be there again because that's a prior issue. So a lot of times it's structure that gets off and then the muscle's going to respond around that. So then your body's going to over-engage muscle, create muscle spasm, trigger points, you'll see inflammation if it's newer, and that's your body basically trying to defend that area and protect you and say, that's a problem, I don't want you to move that. Awesome. So when people say that um, I'm going to uh, get an adjustment or I have a misalignment, or some, some people will use the word subluxation, uh, there's, there's many meanings. Any thoughts on this? That's um, what chiropractors in general work with, the subluxations, and that's, everybody knows what a dislocation is. It's a joint fully separates. Sub is less than a dislocation, so it means something is tilted, torqued, twisted, pushed out of alignment, whatever it is, from a lot of those types of stresses. So we literally create motion through the spine that, that allows your body to function like it's supposed to. It allows the muscles, nerves, everything around that segment to work as it's needed so we basically just help you heal the right way and then other therapies you know massage um, uh, physical therapy stretches rehab etc just reinforce that posture now that things are moving properly to make it stay in place longer last longer and you get more sustained relief perfect i like that so how do you yourself as a chiropractor of you said five years yep how do you go about the process of finding out if somebody is out of a line? We go through um, exams, so we go through um, active range of motion, which is patients going through motion. A lot of it is done from what's called um, static palpation, so we feel with our hands for what doesn't move versus what does move. We have motion palpation, which is similar with motion. Um, a lot of times when we're adjusting, we use a machine called our Pro Adjuster that will um, it's detecting vibration so we scan through the spine and it'll show us with sine waves what's moving versus what's restricted and that um, takes the guesswork out of it so we use our hands for probably 50 percent of our patients we have a machine that adjusts mechanically for about 50 percent of our patients so that basically shows us exactly what needs to move where it needs to move etc so the technique that you would predominantly utilize in your office is it's about uh, it's very subjective, whatever seems to help the most. So we 
use our hands, like I said, about 50% of the time with manual adjustments. A lot of people, a number of reasons people don't see chiropractors in general is because they're scared to be adjusted. So we have a machine that adjusts mechanically. There's no cracking, there's no rotation of the head, etc. It's all done with vibration. And even people that respond better to manual adjustments, we, we can still do that. Then we can go back and double check everything on our pro adjuster to make sure everything moved and see if anything else needs to move as well. So we use that for some people just respond better to our machine. Some people um, are scared of us. Some people are geriatric or osteoporotic where if we do too much with our hands, we can literally break people. So it's a it's another option that we have that not a lot of chiropractors do that can still help people like that. Okay. Interesting. Okay, so I've seen several videos here lately. As you know, social media seems to put out a lot of videos. Um, these are people from naturopaths to physical therapists to doctors of osteopathic medicine uh, to even just general people putting out everyday uh, videos of stating how to crack your back. Uh, but none of these people do this work of the pro adjuster. I've noticed that. Um, curious, what are what are these people doing different from what it is you do with the pro adjuster? Sure. And well, first off, um, when you crack your own back, it doesn't do the same thing. If cracking your own back did the same thing, I wouldn't have a job. There wouldn't be a profession. So when you crack your own neck, you crack your own back, you're moving segments that are already moving properly. We move the ones that are stuck. That's the biggest difference. And when you try to twist and crack your own neck or back, whatever it is, you can make the segment you're moving move too much, which now you have a new issue there, and the segment that's stuck is actually going to be more stuck. So what will happen is, and also just going through that motion, you can put yourself at risk of stringing muscle really easy. You can strain tendons and ligaments a lot easier than you'd think just trying to go through that motion of, of cracking your own back, if you will. You still might get a, a an audible release, or it might feel a little better because you're releasing a joint, but again, you're creating issues. So naturopaths and physical therapists and doctors of osteopathic medicine, are they receiving the same type of uh, treatment or uh, take on uh, proper adjustments, so to speak? Not necessarily. I mean, that's the big difference. It's Everybody does different things. Everybody's specialty is different. So um, like PTs, for example, are they're great at what they do. What they do is muscular, tendon, um, you know, post-surgical rehab, that's their bread and butter. You have surgery, you go rehab it. You have a true muscular tendon issue, you go rehab it. A lot of, and there's a lot of overlap between PTs and chiropractors. Uh, PTs, that's their bread and butter. Chiropractors, our bread and butter is more spine, nerve, disc related issues. We do some muscle work. There's a lot of PTs I know that do joint mobility work, but there's there's definitely a, if somebody came into me and had surgery on their knee and wanted to rehab it, 100% I'm sending them to PT. And we work with a lot of PTs that the exact opposite. They have subluxations, their spine's not moving as it's supposed to. They refer them out to us. So there's a there's overlap, but everybody is good at different things. Not everybody is good at everything, obviously. So it's not, um, everybody's doing different things. And the goal of everybody accomplishing their goals with their patients is going to be different because everybody sees different issues as well. Gotcha. So if I went into a physician's office to see a medical doctor, <clears throat> they typically would uh, treat me with medication, such as a painkiller. Any thoughts on if this is a, a good route for me to go? We talk about this a lot, too. Um, pain med surgery, it's there for a reason. Medical doctors are good at what they do. If you're, if you're ER, urgent care, medical doctor, if you're broken, bleeding, going to die, they're going to fix you. There's a lot of stuff that um, is just out of their scope or underneath their scope, whatever you want to call it, that, um, you know, here's some pain meds, we'll, we'll get the muscle calmed down with some muscle relaxer, we'll, we'll numb the pain. Okay, you're masking it, you're putting a band-aid over it, it's not fixing the problem. And the whole medical model is just built around that, and then let's go do PT and see what happens from there. There's no um, referral base directly from medical doctors to chiropractors for some reason. Uh, my office has been established in, in Arcadia and Phoenix for about 13 years now, so we work with a lot of medical doctors now and have a lot of good relationship with them to where they see stuff like that that's out of their scope. It's not, you know, let's band-aid it, put it some pain meds and muscle relaxers, et cetera. Let's go come see us, and, and we work through problems like that that are underneath their scope. You're not broken, you're not bleeding, you're going to die, and, and we can still help you, we can still fix you. And even I've had patients that come in and, you know, I saw my medical doctor, I got an MRI, I got an x-ray, and it came back clean. 
okay, we'll bring in that MRI or x-ray and let's have a look at it. And we find everybody does different things. So we look for different stuff. Neurologist is looking for, is there nerve damage that needs to be addressed? The surgeon is looking for what needs to be cut open so I can fix you. Stuff that's out of their scope, it's not surgical, it's not meds, that's what we work on. So we, because we're looking for different stuff and do different things, there's stuff that we might find on an x-ray that medical doctors are not necessarily worried about. Sounds in many ways like there's a lot of competition amongst trying to deal with different avenues to help people. Sure. Um, anyway, I recently worked on somebody with whiplash, and they were given a neck brace, mm -hmm. a stiff collar, and a bunch of pills. Is this a good approach or better to have, let's say, movement or motion back into the joint as soon as possible? Your thoughts on... Uh, the person, should we get them out of the brace as soon as possible, uh, get them to uh, uh, a chiropractor, massage, should we uh, go right into keeping the brace on, trying to protect the neck for at least, you know, three months or a month? <laughs> the, the problem with Obviously, if there's something serious going on, there's a fracture in the cervical spine, you have to brace that. Yeah, you got to brace that, and you got to let that heal. If it's if it's true whiplash and there's sprained ligaments, there's strained muscle, then the brace is just the same thing. It's encouraging that posture. It's not going to allow the muscles to to develop and reform and reheal like they're supposed to. It's the same as just like working out and wearing a brace. If you wear a back brace 100% of the time, you're not allowing your muscles to engage like they're supposed to. You're training your body to have that brace on. So when you take it off, it's actually more unstable than it was before, obviously outside of significant injuries. So the goal of, we see a lot of people that have been in car accidents and the goal of whiplash is, whiplash is excess motion through the neck, usually from car accidents. We've seen it just from you know snowboarding, even roller coasters, stuff like that. And the goal is to allow the segments with whiplash to heal properly. So those segments are already moving too much, so we create motion above and below there. Because if something is moving too much, above and below is gonna to start to get restricted to compensate for it. So we create motion above and below those segments that allows the whiplash to heal like it's supposed to. So getting out of the collar helps for sure as soon as possible even without, uh, most people that I see don't wear collars at all. Obviously, like I said, if there's significant injury, that's needed, but creating motion through there as soon as possible is gonna help the healing process right away, and then going in for massage, to getting all the soft tissue, the muscles, everything starting to heal like it's supposed to is by far the best route you can go right away after a car accident or any kind of whiplash. Okay, well, thank you. How often does someone need chiropractic and why? It varies. Um, you know, we have some people I see and have seen weekly for six months. Some people I see every couple weeks. Some people I see monthly. Some people I see quarterly. Sometimes I see people twice a year, like the dentist. What I tell people is, if you have pain, we got to get you out of pain first. We got to get you feeling better. We got to get you moving better, and to a point that is manageable. Then we want to strengthen, stabilize. Then we strengthen, stabilize the areas that are damaged. Now things are good. We're solid. Now we kind of play with the time frame. Now. Can we go a couple weeks without seeing you and kind of back off and you do well? Great. Can we go a month and you do well? Great. From what we've seen, most people, majority of people, it's about every two to three weeks and things are ready to move again. Your spine starts to get restricted from stresses, life, work, whatever it is, and things are ready to move again so it doesn't become a problem a week later, a month later, a year later, whatever it is. And I have people that, um, you know, problems are fixed, we're solid, great, call me and you need me in the future. But I want to see you before it sucks, before I can't move my neck, before I can't bend over. When it's tight, it's stiff, it's sore, it's off. That's when we can keep things on track to where it's not going to become a problem in the future. So it really, it varies. Majority of people, it's about every two to four weeks, I'd say. Like I said, some people I see twice a year like the dentist, and they do well. It really varies person to person. Gotcha. So should people mix their care with other alternative treatments? I think you mentioned that massage is a good thing, massage, stretching. Absolutely. And okay. that's, um, you know, goal, obviously chiropractors are um, non-invasive. You know, what I tell people is surgery, there's a time and place for that. There's other routes you can go before you have to go that route. You can go see a chiropractor, go to physical therapy, go get a massage, try acupuncture. I have no problem with people doing multiple things at once. The only thing I don't love about that is if we throw, you come in and you have back pain and you go get a massage, you do acupuncture, you see a chiropractor, you do physical therapy. 
and you're doing all this therapy and you get better, what helped it? Then you got to keep doing everything because we don't know what helped it. So a lot of times it's easing into one treatment at a time. So go get a massage. How's it do? Go see a chiropractor. How's it do? And kind of ease into different therapies so you don't, one, overload your body, and two, like I said, if you get better, we don't know what helped it, so you got to keep up with everything. Okay. And why is it in some styles of chiropractic, some styles seem focused on hearing, uh, let's say, like an audible sound of cracking and popping? Wow, you don't hear this with the pro adjuster. Sure, and some people, um, they hear that audible release, and, and they think, okay, things are good, they're moving, and that the, the click that you hear when any joint releases is there's gas in the joints and that um, with manual adjustments it basically tells us that the adjustment was deep enough and we created as much motion as we need to at the same time if we're doing manual adjustments and it doesn't pop it's not necessarily a bad thing it can still we can still create motion without that pop and the pro adjuster it it does the same exact thing as manual adjustments it's just not as it, there's no clicking there's no popping there's no cracking it does the same thing though it still creates the motion to the spine and that's the goal of everything is motion. The goal is to create motion so your body will naturally heal itself. We just expedite that process, if you will, and help you heal the right way. So let's say I have a personal trainer, um, and he's pretty good at popping backs from what I understand. Um, he said that he knows what he's doing, and after all, I, I heard some audible cracking sounds when he did it to me once. Do you think that's a good thing? No. I expand on that. You probably don't need to expand any more on that, do you? Thanks, Matt. That was great. I appreciate that. All right. So do you believe that health is attained through multiple means, such as proper diet, stress reduction, uh, chiropractic, massage, and working out? And I pretty much think you do. 100%. And that's, um, it's got to be full lifestyle. If you go whatever you go get a massage and then you go sit for a living 40 hours a week go sit at home and do nothing on your own and get a massage the next month it's gonna be just as bad as it was before if you come see me and i adjust you and you go home and do stuff that's counterproductive you're not gonna get better if you do stuff that's neutral we can get you better slowly if you do stuff that actively helps it you're cleaning up your diet you're exercising you're getting massages you're seeing chiropractor whatever it is you're gonna get better a lot quicker and you're gonna sustain that relief a lot longer too Gotcha. So now I'm going to change the subject here and ask you a little bit of a deeper question sure. here. What is actually success to you? In life and work and what? Uh, let's just say when I just say the word success, you could steer that towards career. You could steer that towards life. What is success to you? To me in my field, you know, in the medical profession I would say success is helping people my success is seeing people get off pain meds and now they're feeling good they can go play with their grandkids success is I have acute low back pain I can't move I can't bend and now you're going and doing crossfit you know whatever it is it's success to me is helping people achieve their goals and that's my um, work successes if you will and that's my passion and what I would call success for myself would you say you're successful if you only seen two people today? It depends on what type of work, and it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I know a lot of great chiropractors that, uh, you know, spend, they see two people a day, and they spend an hour with these people, and they're helping people get better. That's successful in their mind. Everybody's successes is, um, are different to whatever the profession, their goals, whatever it is. Okay. So it's not necessarily just based on just sheer volume and numbers. Not at all. How many people would you say you average a day within your office? Just a rough estimate. Uh, 20, 40, 80? Our typical days, uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, we're there all day. Um, and we're there for nine hours seeing patients. And we see anywhere from 100 to 115 people. Um, our half days, um, we're there for four hours. And we're seeing anywhere from... 50 to 70 people and that's with two doctors okay and every practice is different like uh, i know like i said i have a good friend that's a chiropractor in scottsdale that he sees um about 40 patients a week does really well helps a ton of people does well for himself and things are good so everybody's everybody's business model practice model is going to be different it's whatever 
um, works for you and whatever you connect with as a provider and also you're going to attract those type of patients so people that um, you know need their handheld if you will and, and need that extra time for an hour with the doctor provider whatever it is or they're going to attract and see those type of people that that spend that time with them for us it's we're we're on the end of having people actively help themselves so we go through and people come in and go through active rehab and start working on themselves my physical therapy assistants help them with that and then we spend anywhere from you know two to 15 minutes with patients it just depends on what's going on what the problem is etc that probably explains why i have so many pole dancers as clients then. <laughs> anyway all right so we're gonna wind down with a few more questions um uh, your your number one goal with the work you do, I think you've answered this before, but just expand on that one more time. The, the, the primary goal of you is to do? My primary goal in just work is to help as many people as I can. So we're, uh, um, I'd call it higher volume practice. I know a doc in California that sees um, by himself like 150 patients a day and is just in and out of rooms all day. And so... Uh, my goal is to help as many people as I can. And our business model is set up to where we can help a higher volume of people, not to that extent, but a higher volume of people, and still provide quality of care to where it's not like we're slacking off just to get people in and out of the door, but at the same time, we can help as many people as we possibly can. And if you were not doing this type of work, any thoughts or ideals on what else you would be doing? perhaps like a CIA? The goal was chemistry. always to be a professional athlete. I played baseball and hockey in college, and that was always the big goal. But uh, after that kind of panned out, my undergrad degree is in biochemistry, and so um, I grew up in Washington next to a, close to a power plant. It was about 45 minutes away, so everybody in my hometown was um, engineers, chemists, biologists, et cetera. And so my um, kind of fallback, if you will, if it wasn't going to be healthcare, would have been a, a chemist at this power plant back home. Very interesting. And back home is in Washington, I believe, yep. right? Okay. Eastern Washington. And any mentors that you have within your world, people that you actually seek for advice or look up to outside of me? Sure. The biggest the biggest <laughs> mentor for me is my is my business partner, Dr. Dominic Pissarro. He's the owner of our uh, Arcadia Chiropractic, and we... Um, He's taught me a lot through my years with him, and um, outside of him, uh, one of my biggest mentors from school is um, Dr. Nick Athens. He's a chiropractor um, outside of San Francisco. Um, I forget what town he's in, but he, he taught me a lot on um, biomechanics, body work, getting deeper into muscular tendon type issues, which we learn a lot in school of joint work, adjustment work, disc work, and he kind of... Um, push me over the edge with a lot more therapy that can be incorporated on patients with seeing different issues like that. So we're winding down. We're at the 28 minute mark and we're going to have one last question. And that question would be, I've heard it said um, when people ask, what is chiropractic to you? That'll be the question I'm going to ask. But I've heard some people say it's a restoration and maintenance of health. What is your ideology or your understanding or your terms of what is chiropractic to you? I'll give you two answers. I'll give you my long form answer and I'll give you my elevator speech. So um, chiropractic to me, spine related is freeing up nerve interference. So if your nerves aren't functioning because of subluxations, because of disc bulge, we create motion through the spine to allow your body to function. If you have shoulder pain, I mean, you can have a true issue in your shoulder, your hip, or your knee, but the nerves that come off your spine control your arms, control your legs, etc. So freeing up that nerve is going to allow whatever that body part is to function normally and get you out of pain, get you feeling better, moving better. Um, so chiropractic, in a sense, is creating motion through the spine, especially, but really any joint to allow that joint or spine to free up and move like it's supposed to. So elevator speech-wise, it is helping your body heal the right way. We, we help your body heal and function like it's supposed to. That's my short end term. So would you say then if a person comes to you, let's say with asthma or a kidney issue, is that something you would treat them for, proclaiming to tell them that you can help their problem? Um, or would how would you... 
I see people a lot, whether it's new patients that come in or existing people that have new stuff pop up of weird stuff, um, you know, uh, IBS, Crohn's, um, incontinence or sinus issues, allergy issues. What I say is if we can free up the nerve and that allows your body to function, it's a good side effect we're going to see. I'm not going to go out there and promote or promise that I can fix your allergies, I can fix your kidneys, whatever it is. You can have a true issue there, obviously. If it's related at all to your spine, to your nerves, and it's a good side effect we can see, why not go that route first before we go try to do you know, surgery or go try meds or whatever it is? It's a, it's a non-invasive route that you can at least start there and see if we see progression. If we see that as a great side effect, awesome, we're happy. If we don't, we can always go back to those other therapies. They're not going to go away. Awesome. Matt, it's uh, 30 minutes that we've been talking, and I greatly appreciate uh, coming to the office here, Absolutely. taking some time out and uh, letting clients and letting people know, because I'll post this on Facebook and a few other places here. So thank you for letting those people know, uh, the YouTube world, uh, just what it is you do. Your office, once again, is... Uh, Arcadia Health and Wellness. Arcadia Health and Awareness, and that is at Indian School and like 35th 30, Street. 35th Street, mm -hmm. and that's in Phoenix. Um, do you have a phone number there as well? 602-954-9444. Okay. All righty. And once again, your name was? Dr. Matt Tannenberg. All righty, sir. Well, I greatly appreciate it again. Thank you very much. Thanks okay? for having me. All right, sir. Have a good day.